Uh, my name is Jessica Dean. I am a technical evangelist for Microsoft. I know technical evangelist either sounds really cool or also sounds very interesting and confusing. I have had people ask me if I save people through technology. The short answer is yes, but I can't talk more about that. Um, but truly what I do is I talk to people about technology for a living. That's what a technology evangelist is. Uh, in Microsoft, we have uh, technology evangelists that focus on maybe gaming, developer, uh, and then we have the few, the proud, the long and forgotten IT pros, which I am one of, and there's only about five of us in the United States. Um, so I cover the West region. I'm actually based out of San Francisco Bay Area in California, but I travel all over the West Coast pretty much I think Colorado is about the furthest west that I go um, to get to talk to people about anything related to technology. Now, working for Microsoft, uh, one of the best questions I get asked is why I stand up at Linux conferences and talk to people about Linux and why I have a Mac or have an iPhone. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how Microsoft uh, has really kind of shifted in the past few years as far as its focus. Um, but one of the biggest areas of, is we now have a CEO that's extremely passionate about supporting open source, supporting Linux, and making sure that Linux is treated as a first-class citizen on Microsoft platforms. So when I heard that, that's when I decided to work for Microsoft. A little bit of a background about me is prior to joining Microsoft, I was an MVP for them in Windows, but I had more Apple certifications than Windows. Uh, I was an Apple certified technician for about five years. I was also a systems administrator for uh, Linux systems for a med device company. And I've kind of, I've just kind of been around. I, uh, I started out as an MVP. That's an award that's given annually. Uh, I kind of hung around for about four years until Microsoft decided that they would give me a job. So enough about what a technical evangelist is and a little bit about my background. Let's get into this talk. So first off, you're, if you're in this room, you're probably interested in one of any of these things. One of DevOps, you're interested in Azure, you're interested in Docker, you're interested in continuous deployment tools, or you've heard of CodeShip and you're interested in CodeShip, or you just really wanted to come see Awesome Hair. Any of those options, totally cool. Um, so today we're gonna talk about DevOps, what it is and why it matters, how that kind of sets the stage for this conversation. We're gonna go into a breakdown of Azure, especially not only when you're kind of playing with Azure, but if you're going to play with it in a DevOps kind of perspective, you have to deal with authentication from a non-interactive standpoint. Normally when you would authenticate from a command line, it's gonna pop up and you're either gonna to have to enter a password. If you have MFA enabled, you're gonna to have to enter a second code. And the default pop-up is actually a secondary window. So using a continuous integration, continuous deployment tool can make that authentication very challenging. So we're going to talk about that in the breakdown. We're going to talk about CodeShip because that's the tool that's a continuous deployment tool we're going to use as part of our demo. We're going to do a quick overview of the code and how it works. Then we're going to go into a live demo where we kind of start off a deployment. And then we're going to do a deeper dive into the code. Everything here for the code is written on my Mac. It's all uh, shell scripts and we'll, we'll get into how that kind of works. It is focusing on Azure command line. So if you are interested in Azure, if you are already using Azure, if you want to get better at Azure, all the code I'm demoing is also open source. It is available on GitHub. Uh, you can dive into it and learn a little bit more that way, but I'm gonna also explain hands-on how it works. And then we'll wrap up with another live demo and we'll have questions at the end. Uh, so getting further into it, if you've been in the industry for a while, you kind of know that we're, we're changing. There's this shift. Uh, just a show of hands, how many people in the room would consider themselves more developer? Okay, how many people would consider them more operations or IT pro? Okay, so we have a good equal balance. So of course, um, it's depending on how long you've been around, of course you always get along with your developers if you're IT pros. And developers, you always get along with IT pros because they always understand exactly what your problem is. No? Oh, okay. So as a result, we have this kind of shift where everything's changing. Everyone wants everything more immediate. We want everything faster. We are seeing a shift as far as uh, how technology actually is being delivered. Everyone has a device. Everyone is bringing new devices into an office. You're no longer having just physical servers. There's now this push to the cloud. We're seeing a complete change. So it's estimated that one million devices per hour are gonna be coming online by 2020. The average age of S&P corporations by 2020 is gonna be only 12 years old. And then 60% of computing is estimated to be in the public cloud by 2025. 2025 is almost 10 years from here. I'm gonna estimate that that percentage is gonna be significantly higher. We're already seeing a shift. We're already seeing a hybrid scenario in enterprise. So that puts us in a situation, especially as for us for Microsoft, is how do we, 
help you guys as far as developers and IT pros, how do we help you be more efficient at your job or more efficient at whatever you're trying to produce? That comes into where now we have to adopt this mindset DevOps. DevOps is a mindset. It's not a tool. It's not a package you go out and buy. It is a mindset of getting developers and operations to speak the same language and allow everyone to be able to communicate and work more effectively together. If we can really encourage that and develop tools that incorporate that mindset, then we can help everyone be more productive and be more efficient. So I like this kind of uh, example because everyone's trying to explain what DevOps is. It's a job title. It's automation. It means faster and smaller releases. It's development and operations collaboration. In short, it is development and operations collaboration. We're going to make sure that both sides of the, the school dance floor can actually come in the middle and start actually getting along. So there's three parts to it. There's people, process, and tools. If we make sure that we are able to engage with the people and hear what our customers are saying, i.e. customers want to be able to deploy Linux into Azure, which is Microsoft's cloud, if we can listen, then we can help start implementing better tools for that process. Uh, some DevOps practices is we have automated testing, continuous integration, continuous deployment. Those tool methods is what we're going to focus on very heavily in today's talk. Uh, there's monitoring, there's code reviews, there's automated testing. There's so much that kind of goes into DevOps. From an Azure perspective, we give insight and metrics and monitoring into what you're doing, what, what you're using with your deployment. If you're using a container service like Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, or DCOS, or if you're using standard IaaS for infrastructure as a service, if you're using web apps, we give you those insight tools. But the other side of the coin is how to automate that. It's one thing to go into a portal, click, and say, okay, I'm going to navigate around the SKUI and deploy. It's another thing to say, okay, I wrote the shell script that can go ahead and deploy using Azure CLI. But what happens if I want automatic testing of that code to work and automatic deployments to go through. That's where we now get into <coughs> DevOps practices and habits, and that's where we get into continuous integration and continuous deployment. So again, I mentioned that it is a three-stage conversation. We have to make sure that, we have, that we're it, talking to the right people, that we identify the process that we want to implement so we have a big picture, and then we want to make sure that we're using the right products. Benefits of implementing DevOps practices is that IT organizations were two times likely to exceed their profitability, market share, and productivity goals. It allows you to improve performance. You have 60 times fewer failures, and you're able to deploy code 30 times faster. Because for example, as we're gonna see in this particular demo, we take the code that I write locally on my system, I push it to GitHub, and because GitHub is already connected to the continuous deployment tool code ship that we're using, it automatically fires off that build. And based on the code that I wrote, which is just a simple shell script, there's enough retry logic in there to where if a resource group already exists, move on to the next step. And so it's able to cycle through and automatically push that out without anything needed on my end as far as operations or anything needed on the developer's end. We're able to test it and deliver it to our end users that much faster. So the first part of it is plan and track, develop and test, then release, and then we get into monitor and learn. And we'll should talk about how the tools today can play into each one of these steps. Ultimately, you have the plan and track, develop and test on the development side, and then release, monitor, and learn on the production side. And you can do, using with Azure, using this code, you can release to a QA and staging branch before you automatically switch over to prod. So it adds more flexibility and more scalability into your already existing workflow, but also puts try and catch situation scenarios in there to where you can catch if there is an error and you can go back and fix that much faster. So on the plan and track is you're able to track your progress, manage work, and the project starts. So once you have your code developed, like I said, you, we set this up where you can push it to a public repository and have that automatically fire off as long as you have your uh, idea kind of already in place as far as what you want to deploy, what you want to build, what your company is, is demanding of you. And then on the develop and test, after the iteration starts, developers are able to look at that and say, okay, where did this fail? Where did this break? We have insight into the logs. We have insight into, we know that it's not, the IT person didn't make a mistake. You pushed it directly to this repository. It fired off. So now we can go into where the actual error is, and it kind of opens up this communication where previously two people weren't speaking the same language. Now you have insight on both ends where you're able to actually collaborate. And so again, also with source code management, the other benefit of using tools like this as part of DevOps is you have 
rollbacks of all your code. So if you know that this release worked and now the release you just pushed in, because you're using tools like GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab, you can roll backwards to previous commits where code did work and then figure out what changed. You can look at the diffs between those two codes as far as from a developer standpoint, and then ops can quickly roll back to make sure that that tool is already available to end users. And then you also have test management where you can do test planning. Developer can go into their testing. So you can give uh, developers their own public repo and their own QA site for them to test before they say that it's ready for prod release anyway. Continuous integration uh, is a DevOps practice. I've mentioned CI uh, a little bit here. So that's where you take, you have your developer and your operations. You take it to your source repository. It automatically fires off the build. And then it allows your developers to test. So the value behind that is you have frequent integration, you have higher quality and repeatability. Uh, your issues, you're able to delay delivery delays, and then you, have, you can identify either non-working or low quality code. Uh, with release, when all the tests pass, and you'll get, because of the way that it ties directly into GitHub, you'll be able to see if the build failed, if the build passed, if, um, if the build is still going. Uh, when all the tests pass, the build is deployed to, to either testing environments or production environments. Uh, but in this particular stage, it would be in testing environments. And then you would be able to continue on with the release process. Continuous delivery is, again, very similar to continuous integration. But you still have your devs and ops pushing to the source repository, uh, development, staging, and production. So you can push it to different parts of the cloud. Using a tool like CodeShip, you can actually tag your services or your steps, which we'll define. You can tag which branch you want. If you have your QA branch for on GitHub, if you have your staging branch, if you have your production branch, you can choose which steps you want to fire off for which branches. It's completely customizable. And so again, with continuous delivery, it ties into that continuous integration, it ties into the release management stage, and then it gives you continuous quality. Uh, infrastructure as a code is another practice. So the other benefit of all of this is I, I mentioned that not only do you have your source control where you can roll backwards to pre-existing code, all everything we're going to demo today is written down in a shell script, which means if I need to re-stand up that infrastructure yesterday because my manager is barking at me, I already have the infrastructure documented. If they want me to stand something up that I did a year ago, the infrastructure is already in code. I don't have to remember what application did I install? What did I do? What version of Java were you using? I don't have to go backwards. It's already documented and written down. And it can be scaled and updated and modified if you use variables or um, uh, it will if you use variables. And so we'll demo that as well. And then again, after everything gets deployed, Azure, using Azure gives you insights where you can view the metrics, you can view logs, you can see uh, how the performance of your code is going. You can see any particular areas if there's if it's a web app and there's issues as far as with load or you're getting high requests on a weekend, you have insight into that as well. So you can use that to plan the next iteration for your next development and your next release. So it's this constant circle. And so again, with Monitor and Learn, you get feedback to your management, you have application uh, telemetry, uh, telemetry uh, performance, and load testing. And so the CI CD process, just another graphic that kind of shows it, is from your system, and you do have logs. It pushes to a code repository. It fires off and does the build deploy. It's going to go through and automate the testing, which can get deployed to a QA site if you want to have a, a small pilot user test. And then you can, again, monitor that, improve, and it goes right back around. So it's just this constant. This particular thing is obviously a rectangle. But it would be just a constant circle where it's, it's allowing you to be more efficient and more productive. So why does all of this matter? Why does DevOps matter? Well, since obviously the industry is changing and things need to get pushed that much faster, we need to give the tools to you guys as far as the people who are out there in the field, developers and, and IT pros, we need to give you the tools to be more efficient in your job, in your workflow. And so all of this sets up the stage for today's conversation. We're going to talk about Azure, which gives you all of those tools and monitor and insight. And Azure itself has direct integration into GitHub. But then you can use it with tools like Jenkins and CodeShip and VSTS and any one of those tools that's going to implement CI CD into your practice as well, which is then going to take and implement infrastructure as code and all of these other keywords we've talked about in the past 15 minutes. So it all kind of matters because it plays out into the bigger picture of more efficiency, better productivity, better performance, and a better end user experience, which is the ultimate end goal. Because for IT, that means your phone rings less. To, to less 
less frequently at 2 a.m. And for developers, that means less times of you banging your head against keyboard because IT didn't listen to you. And I've kind of been on both sides, so I, I appreciate what both IT and, and operations uh, or and developers go through. So introducing, we have Azure and CodeShip. So this past year, Microsoft actually partnered with CodeShip, which is a continuous deployment tool, to bring support to their offering. They are a continuous integration, continuous deployment tool. Previously, they were only able to support AWS. While they wanted to support Azure, there was one big piece that they couldn't get past, which was the authentication piece. And that's a piece where I've talked to people who are using tools <coughs> other than CodeShip, whether that's Jenkins or even Microsoft's own tool. The biggest thing that we had to overcome was the authentication. How do we securely authenticate from a command line level without any end user interaction into our Microsoft Azure subscription? What if we have multiple subscriptions? So there are certain hurdles that we as Microsoft had to kind of overcome in a scripting environment to allow CodeShip to offer that. And we're gonna go through and, and explain how that works and how we did that. So essentially how this process works is we're taking the same DevOps practice that we just reviewed and we're putting it into an actual application. So we have ourself here, where you're pushing either to GitHub, Bitbucket, or GitLab. That's gonna connect automatically to CodeShip. So we'll demo that. You create a project on CodeShip, you enter in your repository. CodeShip does the continuous integration and the continuous deployment. And because we are using, we're telling CodeShip to fire off this bash script, it's automatically going through and connecting to Azure. And so the biggest piece that we had to figure out is how to get CodeShip to connect to Azure. So we'll demo that. And with Azure, again, you have your web apps, your infrastructure, container service. You, essentially, because you, we've created this authentication, anything that exists in Azure, you can now deploy from a command line level through that non-interactive authentication session through the CI-CD tool. So it's completely scalable and completely malleable. So the Azure breakdown, again, as I've said, biggest piece we had to identify was how do we connect? So we had to talk about authentication. We had to create a non-interactive uh, non authentication method. And to do that, we're gonna use what's called a service principle name, or SPN. And there's actually, to make this easier, rather than just firing off a ton of commands that everyone's gonna forget, I actually wrote an SPN creation script that has a menu and everything. So it's gonna pop up, it's gonna force you to log in, it's gonna say, you know what, you have more than one sub subscription, which subscription would you like to create this SPN for? It will then output that back to you, that information, but it's also gonna create two files that CodeShip's gonna use. One is it's gonna create an azure.env file, that's an environment file with the SPN information that has the name, the password, the tenant ID. And then it's going to encrypt that so that because the encrypted version is going to have to get pushed to GitHub. You don't want any of that information in plain text, but CodeShip needs that in the GitHub repo to be able to fire it off. So it's gonna create the encrypted version, it's gonna copy the plain text version to your docket ignore so you won't have to worry about it, and it's gonna make your life even easier. And there are different versions of that code. If you go to my blog, that'll be, there'll be a slide at the end um, where you can scale that outside of CodeShip. If you don't wanna deal with the encryption and you just wanna export it to environment variables, that code also exists. It's, like I said, it's just a shell script, so it's completely malleable. So the example of the code, once you have the SPN, what our code actually is going to do to create that login as part of our, our bash script is we just use az login, we're telling it we're gonna use a service principle, and then we're just using variables for SPN, password, and tenant. Those variables is what's included in the Azure ENV that's encrypted, so we don't ever have to update our script. All we have to do is update the environment variables file and make sure that's in our repo. So it's, again, recyclable, and that's, one of the key tools where, again, we wanted to go back to infrastructure as code. So the next part of the breakdown is we have the code ship breakdown. So we have, there's two parts to it. One, we have code ship AES. That's our AES tool that allows us to encrypt and decrypt. Uh, using the service principle creation script, we are doing that locally because that's a part where we have to set up our environment to be able to connect and uh, connect our GitHub repo, our code ship project, and our, uh, our Azure uh, environment. <laughs> So you also do have to, there are prerequisites, you do have to have a project on CodeShip already created where you can grab your CodeShip AES. And then you also have to have Jet installed, which is a local tool from CodeShip. All of this is all actually also in a readme on GitHub, both on their GitHub repo, on my GitHub repo, so you don't necessarily have to know all of this. I'm just explaining how we're gonna do this demo and setting it up. After you have the CodeShip AES and Jet installed, you can run the service principle creation script because it can encrypt that particular Azure EMV file using the AES code from the project. It's, it's project specific, <coughs> not account specific. So after you have that, you can now start to set up your environment and your staging. You're gonna need to set up services that then you can tell uh, CodeShip uses a services file and a steps file. It's written in YAML. And so 
your steps are going to have to create or have to connect and refer back to the services that you specify. So your first service in this particular uh, demo is going to be that we're going to stand up our infrastructure. So we're going to create our Docker Swarm Azure Container Service as part of our first service. The second service gets a little bit trickier. And this comes back to where it's kind of about Microsoft. So Microsoft for Azure Container Service supports Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, and DCOS. For DCOS and Docker Swarm, you actually have to create an SSH tunnel in order to connect into that sw Swarm cluster to manage it and deploy out images. So how do we do that from a continuous deployment tool? Well, we have to create a, an SSH tunnel essentially in Docker. So we have to Dockerize an SSH tunnel with a private key, with other, it, it starts getting a little bit messy. So all of that's written and we'll show how that happens, but essentially we have our deployment and our tunnel as our services. So then the first step can be, okay, run the deployment, run this shell script. And then the second step is through this tunnel, run these Docker commands. And so if from the steps file, you put Docker run nginx port 8080, it's gonna automatically know I'm firing that command against the cluster because it's running through the SSH tunnel that's Dockerized. And so we'll explain how that works as well. So now we'll get into the demo. So let's hope the demo gods are with me because live demos on public Wi-Fi always goes great. <laughs> so the first part of it, I mentioned that code ship AES and I mentioned the service principle creation script. So we're gonna have to first create a project on code ship so I can grab the AES key and then I'm gonna to have to create a repo so that we're gonna use that. And then I can run the service principle creation script and show you what that looks like. So let me go ahead and start a new project here. I'm gonna use GitHub. And we'll call this Linux Fest North West dash CS. We'll create that. It's just an empty repository. I'm gonna copy that. I'm gonna paste that over here. Because that's now linking, again, GitHub to CodeShip. We're going to choose CodeShip Pro. And so now this is going to kind of explain everything that I've already told you where you have to define the environment. We'll go through that a little bit more. But the piece that we care about right now is going to be under general. It's our AES key. And if this is going to be a little slow, I can always switch over to public Wi-Fi or my Wi-Fi. Okay, so we have the AES key right here. So I'm gonna go into Visual Studio Code. By the way, Microsoft Open Source Visual Studio Code. So it is a free application. It works on Mac, Linux, and Windows. Um, and it has GitHub integration right into it. So it actually means you can work and do everything you need to do right from Visual Studio Code. So I'm gonna go into CodeShip AES right here. I'm gonna replace the key that previously existed and I'm gonna save it. So now I have my AES key that I can use to encrypt and decrypt uh, files that I'm gonna create. So the first file, let me clear this out. Clearly I'm a Star Wars fan, notice the, the Rebel Alliance. Uh, I hope uh, no one is claiming anything other than Rebel Alliance, I'm just kidding. So let's go ahead and fire off our service principle creation script. Before I fire it off, I can show you a brief overview. It's really, really simple. It's essentially prompting end users to enter an SPN name. It's gonna grab the name, password, and role entered in variables. And then it's gonna go through, force you to log in. I created a function where it's gonna create the actual SPN itself. It's gonna output that information to plain text so that you can see that it was successful. And then it's gonna copy that to the Azure ENV file, confirm it was created. It's gonna move that Azure ENV file to the docket ignore. And then it's gonna also, uh, again, echo back. And here, right down here, the jet encrypt that's where we're actually encrypting it again with JET. So you will need JET locally installed in order to run the script. Uh, there is also on another script, uh, right, actually this one, uh, most of my scripts also use JQ. You need to use JQ 1.5 or higher, otherwise you'll get errors. Something about the way that AZ login works. Anyway, we'll go back to here and run the script. So we'll enter a name. We'll do Linux Fest, North, Linux Fest Northwest demo. I'm gonna enter, of course, a very super secret password. And I entered the role. You can go there in the script itself. There is a hyperlink where you can go and learn a little bit more about role, roles. Usually to be able to create uh, IaaS infrastructure and Azure Container Service, you're going to want to choose the role of contributor. So now if you're not already logged in, which we're not, we're going to copy the code here and we're going to go to aka.ms uh, forward slash device login so that we can actually authenticate our command line. So I'm just going to go here. I'm going to enter in that code I copied. 
press continue, choose my Azure subscription, and that signed me in. So now if you notice also here, I have the portal pulled up. <coughs> And essentially what the SPN is creating is it's creating an app registration through Azure Active Directory that's gonna allow you to deploy applications. So currently right now under, if we scroll down, it's under Azure Active Directory, under app registrations. I don't have any pre-existing anything. So going back to the uh, script that I'm running, it does pop up with you have five available subscriptions. Which subscription would you like to use? I'm gonna choose my enterprise subscription. If you don't know the subscription, you can always go over here in your Azure portal and see the name of the subscription to confirm that it's con correct. So the name of this subscription is Visual Studio Enterprise. Here we see Visual Studio Enterprise is number three. So I enter three and press enter. It's now gonna go through, it's gonna set the subscription and it's gonna create this SPN. And so while it creates that, again, we can go back over here to Azure Active Directory. We can go to app registrations and kind of watch it create. We watch that that just happened right there. And again, this is done locally so that we can set up the environment in the cloud, so to speak. So it, we get the confirmation back. It successfully created it. Yes, I do realize it's in plain text. I'm not saying this is super secret and secure. I'm saying this is just a tool to help you. Um, obviously, my passwords are amazing. And then we also get the confirmation that the uh, Azure.emv file was created. It was copied to .git ignored, and it was successfully encrypted. We can also go over and verify that because we can see this. I just have the folder for this particular, what I'm gonna use for the Git repo pulled up already in Visual Studio Code, but I can view this was the information I entered um, or this was the name that was created uh, and then this is it encrypted. So now let's go ahead and since we have, we're gonna start actually deployment and we're gonna, while it's doing the deployment because it'll take about 20 minutes, it has to create all the infrastructure, we're gonna talk about how all of this works. So the first part of it is I'm going to uh, initialize this particular repo, so let me clear. So git init, we're gonna do git add, we're gonna add all the contents. I've already set this particular git ignore up so it's not gonna upload anything. I will say as a part of this demo, it is going to upload a private and public key pair. Uh, usually I would probably recommend doing this on a private repo uh, if you're going to upload any kind of secure information. But this is again just for a live demo. And then we're gonna do, let's see, name of it Linux Beth Marcellus, okay. We'll confirm that that was added. We do see that that was added. And then should be able to push this script. We've, in, we've I believe, authenticated everything. Okay. So now if we refresh our GitHub, we will see our push. So we see that that happened. If we go back over to our project, and of course, live demos are awesome. Let's go back over here. So we'll do some like there's good job doing a poll on it or did it create a webhook in a webhook. So yeah, it uses a webhook into <laughs> JLD and Linux. I'm making sure that I use the right repo. I've done this demo so many times, so you need to check your webhooks to see if they, they fire an off within your GitHub settings. No, and you know what? Actually I just noticed, yeah, it didn't normally it sends me an email that the SSH key actually went through. So let's go ahead and since we have a little bit of time, I'm gonna delete this and I'll recreate that real quick. I'm gonna delete this project. Okay. So we'll start again, make sure that this time it does actually connect, even though it said it was. We'll call it something else in case something weird there. Call it Linux Beth, Linux Fest Northwest code. Right. Create that repo. Let me clear out this 
particular folder. Okay. So remember, now that it's a new project, I'm going to have to create a new AES key and redo the encryption. Which is fine since, okay, so I'm going to copy this key, paste that right into here, save that. And just for the sake of time, what I will do is I'm just going to go ahead and encrypt this manually because I already created the SPN. It already exists. So this is the other benefit. After you create it using the script and you have JET installed locally, you can re-encrypt that with for a new project because the app registration already exists in Azure. So we're just going to re-encrypt that. That has now changed the encryption. And so if we go back over here. We see Linux Fest Northwest code. And we see Linux Fest, North, Linux Fest Northwest code. So let me go ahead and do git init again, git add, git commit, git init, add, call this one, code. Okay, so that should push to GitHub, which already has the webhook in. Hasn't said what books. That's a little interesting. Gotta love live demos. All right. Well, while that's going, let's or while maybe there's a delay on the GitHub because it is currently. Connected. I haven't actually experienced this issue with CodeShip before. Code trip is currently having issues with their GitHub connection. Right now? Yeah, it's in, it's in your login screen. So next tab left, customize support section. Oh. It's all partially degraded service. So of course, yeah. live demos are awesome. <laughs> well, and it might help also obviously if I pay attention to detail and read. Well, anyway, again, that, that was just gonna go off and do the deployment. Luckily, I do have other projects where we can take a look at the project that I use actually for developing it. So let's go back to this particular one. And you can actually see, so not only can you see any builds where I stopped it, you can see the ones that completed, you can also see the ones that failed. So if I choose to load more, it gives you that insight and that's gonna coincide with the, if we click on any of the commits, that's gonna coincide with the branch that also exists here. So if I look at this particular repo, <coughs> and look at any of the commits, I can see where it failed or where it succeeded. Um, this is one that was collaborated, so I can also see where success um, and insight into fail. So let's take a look at how that's kind of working. Let me go back to the presentation because I think I have a breakdown and then we'll actually show the demo of the script since I can't do the live demo with CodeShip. Which is funny because they actually asked me to record it for this particular session and so that's gonna be a fun conversation. <laughs> Why did you guys do maintenance the day I was doing the presentation? Um, okay, so code should break down. I mentioned that we have services, uh, services file and a steps file. The first part of it is the services file. So our first service I mentioned, we have to do a deployment. So this is written in YAML. For the sake of PowerPoint, I know that I didn't do the right YAML format, but remember the two spaces in and we'll go from there. So the first part of it is I'm specifying a base image to use because CodeShip itself is actually an AWS infrastructure and actually spins up a Docker container to fire off these steps. So the first part of it is I'm specifying the Azure CLI Python latest. That is Azure CLI 2.0. There are two different versions of Azure CLI. There's a node version 1.0, which is not very good. I don't recommend ever trying to learn it unless you're gonna take your Azure certification test because that's on it. Otherwise, use Azure CLI 2.0, which is written actually in Python. So it's the latest release. We released it about two months ago. It is a lot more powerful. It allows you to work with things like Azure Container Service uh, and pretty much be able to manage a lot more than you previously could with just standard uh, Azure CLI 1.0. There are slightly different commands as well, but there's a wonderful documentation on it, which I don't say very often. 
Um, and then the next part of it is we have the encrypted environment variable file, which that's the part that has, again, our SPN information. That's why we want to make sure that we are passing that in a secure method. And then the environment uh, variables itself, all of these variables correspond to the shell script to the variables there. So CodeShip allows you to pass in the variables you specify from the services file directly into the shell script, which means that when you're using this in a continuous deployment method or infrastructure as code, you can just simply update the resource group, the location, the service name. You can update all of these changing variables immediately from services without having to go back and look through 200 lines of code um, and then change, I don't know, 17 different entries. So it allows you to do this just once. And then we're also mounting a volume so that you can pass data back and forth. Uh, this is really helpful if, like, let's say that you're going to have the deployment generate SSH keys uh, so that that way you can copy the SSH keys back and forth from one service to another, or from your container to your host. Um, and then the second piece of it is that SSH tunnel. Uh, so to do the SSH tunnel, we actually have to build an image because we have to build an image that's going to containerize that SSH tunnel to where when you call that image, the tunnel is already open and allows you to pass Docker commands. So the tunnel itself that we're going to name it, we're going to name it SSH tunnel. We're going to specify a Docker file path. I'll show you the Docker file. We're going to tell it to add Docker because essentially since CodeShip is running uh, this service in a Docker container, I'm now telling it to also run Docker commands in a Docker container. So you kind of get an inception thing going on. So they have a command built in for that, which is add Docker. And then again, I'm specifying my encrypted environment variable file, and then I'm specifying local environment variables for this particular service. Uh, again, the orchestrator is Swarm. I tried to make this particular script and these resources something that can be interchangeable. We did actually end up adding support for Kubernetes as well because of this. Uh, and then you'll also notice local port and remote port. The plan is also to add support for DCOS. DCOS uses port 80. So we wanted, rather than going back and updating the script, to just be able to update your services file with whichever port you want it to use, and then it can create that SSH tunnel automatically. So the steps part of it, after you've defined the services, you're going to connect each step to a particular service. So you notice I'm naming this just so that I can have a cleaner name as far as how CodeShip identifies it. The service itself is ACS deploy, and then the command is I'm telling it to run a bash script, and I'm specifying where that deployment script is. If I go back, you notice I mounted the volumes at deploy, and here I'm specifying the script is now at deploy. So it tells me here's my repo is mounted at this volume. It makes it easier for you to actually manage what files exist where. Um, and then the second step, we're getting a little, uh, we're doing something a little bit different. So our second step is we're actually creating a serial step because we're going to use one service for a series of commands. And our, our step itself is SSH tunnel. The service is the service we defined for SSH tunnel. And we're going to run multiple commands because I want to run a, an Nginx container. Uh, I want to be able to confirm that that was running. And then there's a second con command usually that I run that runs my own image. So if I push it to Docker Hub, I can have it go out and pull and run that on port 8080. By default, Azure Container Service has two different load balancers. It has a master's agent and a, a, an, a, an actual agent's agent. So your master is for the SSH tunnel that allows the authentication, but ports aren't open. Your agents balancer is the one that actually web applications would actually be viewed on. So if you have your public DNS, it goes, uh, I'll show you what the, uh, I guess, DNS looks like. But by default, the ports open for that is going to be 80443 and 8080. So the Azure Container Service Breakdown, again, uh, you can do deployments of different methods. You can do via the portal, which would be manual, Azure CLI 2.0, where you're typing in manual commands through your CLI. Or you can do it through a deployment bash script using CLI 2.0. Uh, if you have that all documented in a bash script, you're starting to implement that DevOps practice of infrastructure as code. And then the second piece of it, again, as I've said, is the SSH tunnel to Docker Swarm cluster. So this is, I have an entire post of this on my blog if you want to understand a little bit more about how the SSH tunnel works, because I've been told it kind of blows people's minds. Um, because you're essentially, you're not actually SSHing into the system using this particular command, you're just creating an open tunnel, and then you're exporting um, an environment variable for Docker host, which is built into Docker. And if you notice, by the way, it is, you're exporting the environment variable colon 2375, not just 2375, it has to have that colon. But as a result, any commands you run locally on your system for Docker is now going to run through that tunnel. And so that's how we're doing this in that Dockerized instance. So the end result is you're passing Docker commands natively to Swarm through the newly created tunnel image. And that image is going to have the public and private key pair already authenticated, so you won't have to open that every time, which is helpful in continuous deployment scenarios. 
Chances are, would you ever use that outside of it? Probably not. If you wanted to do something really, really nerdy and impress your friends, maybe. I don't have any friends, so I can't tell you. <laughs> um, so again, just to show you, just to recap kind of how it works. Again, you're pushing to GitHub, Bitbucket, or GitLab when Codeship is working. Um, and then Codeship is going to be able to do that continuous integration, continuous deployment. And because of the script you're firing off, it pushes out to Azure. So I've kind of already showed you a little bit here when we looked into previous deployments. But again, the benefit of that is now you can see where builds failed. You can see where they, where they succeeded. Or would the demo have worked and Codeship did not decide to do maintenance at 11 AM on a Saturday? Um, you would also see that it's pending that the build is currently running. So it gives you insight. As you would see that here on GitHub, that would also reflect what you would see in Codeship. I, I mean, a standard CI CD tool. You would see this in Jenkins, VSTS, whichever tool you're using. Um, and so again, like an, an image of this, which I know it's a little bit harder to see. I'll show you in a second here. This was one of the test deployments I did where I just did one simple commit. Again, you see the services that I mentioned, the ACS deploy and the SSH tunnel. Each service, after it has to build that and it pulls that image, it's then going through and running each step. So the Azure ACS deployment, it would actually give you insight into what it's doing. You can watch that shell script as it fires off, which I'll show you a little bit clearer in a second here. And then we have the SSH tunnel where it's running a series of four commands. The first command is it's creating an Nginx uh, website. The second command is it's doing just Docker ps-a, so I can confirm that that created and routed to that port. The third command is that it's going to do a node app, which is just my very, very simple hello world, literally in plain text. But it's an image I pushed to Docker Hub just as a demo. And then again, Docker ps-a, so I can confirm that that actually did run, connect, and it is uh, serving. So now we'll go back to the demo, which is going to be a little bit different since I couldn't push anything. But we'll show you the actual code. And I'm going to show you what you just saw a little bit clearer. Hopefully it shows up. Yeah, I think this is a little bit easier to read. So let me go to one that was not broken. We'll go to one that succeeded. So these are all reacting to having already pushed to a branch. This is be because because code ships down right now. Like I can't show you something live. Sure. So this is going back. This is this is a live branch that I still have. This is one that I used actually for de development for creating it. Um, and by the way, just to show you, code ship does have all of their stuff right now online. This particular code ship dash library Azure deployment. This is their GitHub with all the scenarios that we wrote. Um, the master one covers where you can do just IaaS infrastructure. ACS swarm is the code for this. That and we're looking at my version of the repo of that code. And then we have SSH deploy, which is the SSH tunnel a little bit more in detail. Um, but yes, to, so. So this is, this is the continuous deployment side of things rather than the, is this, is this change good enough? Can you test it before I merge it? Type Correct. Okay. Um, and we actually didn't because <laughs> we want, because this was on my private repo yeah. um, and there's code chip. We didn't do merge or pull requests, so you won't see any of that reflected on theirs. This is code where I said, hey, I created this repo, go grab it, copy, paste, and a little bit like that. But <laughs> we're looking at how that actually worked because as I'm going through and writing it, all the hurdles and barriers that I ran into, we had to say, okay, this code failed. Now I have to go back and fix it and run into this hurdle. Um, and we had the same thing where we had to do Kubernetes because we had to play with a little bit of different um, deployment for Kubernetes. It functions a little bit differently. Um, I don't have that on my projects. That was done by a colleague of mine. Uh, but we do have that code also on their website. I think that's actually in um, there's actually a branch for that, I believe, or maybe not. There's a branch for that online if, you, if you're interested. They're still updating a bunch of stuff. This has been a, a six-month partnership with them. So again, if we take a look at the service, you notice I mentioned that, it, that CodeShip runs by creating Docker containers. So we're looking at it. It's pulling down the image that I told it to, and it's downloading that image. If I needed to tell it to build an image, you can actually watch, for example, an SSH tunnel since we're building an image. It pulls down any of the base that it needs, and then it's going to go through and actually start the build. And I'll show you the Docker file I'm using. But it's from my particular uh, Alpine version of Docker, where I actually put Docker pre-installed Docker binaries, because trying to get Docker on Alpine was, at least 17.03, was really challenging. Um, and then it's going through, it's copying any particular uh, keys that need to be copied. It's making sure SSH is turned on as a service, telling it it's already adding that key in as part of the identity. <laughs> Um, it's setting the environment variable. It's confirming that that was actually added. Um, again, this is where it gives you that insight into those logs. Now you can see where your code failed, where it, where it succeeded. Um, it sets the entry point for that SSH tunnel script, which we'll take a look at for how that's creating. 
Um, and then it's specifying in case you just wanted to run this outside of, since you can use Jet, which is CodeShip's tool that's running in the cloud, you can use that locally. If you wanted to test this locally and just create an SSH tunnel image, it would the automatic entry point would just be shell script and you can just type in shell commands. So you can see that as part of the build. That's it building the service. The next insight is the steps itself. So the first step is where it's going to go through and actually uh, deploy out the actual infrastructure. So we look at it, we see first this first step right here, that's where it actually has to authenticate. So we confirm that it did authenticate, it is able to get the, uh, the subscription information back and it is able to create the, this, the name of this particular resource group at the time was Codeship AZ. So it created the resource group and we get that confirmation. Now it's going to begin the Azure service uh, uh, creation. So it's gonna go through, start the long running operation. That will take a few, it, it, it varies depending on how fast Azure's being. This particular time apparently took eight minutes. It usually takes about 20. Um, so it has to go out and actually deploy out. There's, as for Azure Container Service, there's between 17 and 19 different resources that it has to go and create and storage accounts and depends how fast Microsoft is as far as being receptive. And so you can see again the logs where it's creating the, I mentioned you have an agent FQDN, you have a master FQDN, um, and then it even gives you the SSH uh, information back for if you just wanted to SSH into the master's agent. You don't want to do thing fr things from the master's cluster. You don't want to deploy images, but if you had to get in and actually ma manage that from an SSH session. So scrolling down to the bottom, I've added in important information. So that's information that you would probably want to keep. That gets taken over into the second part of the step, but the important information is your master's F FQDN and your agent's FQDN. Um, because it tells you what your management load balancer and your agent's load balancers are. Your web applications, any web applications you're deploying, is going to be viewed on your agents, and it just confirms that back to you. So if we look over at the SSH tunnel, all I'm doing now is through that SSH tunnel image is I'm running Docker commands. So the first Docker command I supplied, and it confirms back right here on this particular line, the first Docker command supplied was just run an Nginx con container, name it Docker Nginx, and run it on port 80. 80, 80, 80 for the container and 80 externally. Uh, and then it actually says that it completed and then it confirms back the command that was completed. So then you can see the next step, docker ps-a, you can see that here it was completed. You're just, run, you're just firing these commands <coughs> through that tunneled image. And then the same thing for if I wanted to pull my own image from Docker Hub. This one's fun because it shows that I'm not just pulling something that Docker created. It can go out to Docker Hub and pull anything that's based on what was written. And then it confirms back to, I now see that there are two different containers running. One is running on port 8080 and one is running on port 80 itself. So if we go back over to the code, we'll take a look at how that itself is actually deploying. So the infrastructure part of it, I first created a function for the outputs part because at the end of each step, I want it to output the master, master FQDN, the agent's FQDN, and the, uh, uh, even the connection string. So if you specified a username or uh, if you specified anything different than the default. The, de the default is Azure user. I in production, you probably don't want to use that. So the next step of it after we, let's minimize that function, um, you now have your login. Again, that goes back to what we saw on the slide. We have, and I'm hoping, yeah, you guys can kind of see that, okay. So right here on lines 28 through 32 is AZ login service principal with the SPN password and tenant ID. That corresponds again to the Azure environment which is just setting those variables and has it encrypted. So we go back to this, once we have it logged in, it's now gonna create the group only if the group exists. If you don't have the if else statement in there and just say, hey, create a group, if the group already exists, it's gonna end up failing um, because it can't, do what it's told to do. So in that case, I mean, that's where you have to tie it in and, and script it a little bit more because there is no um, logic really behind the way that AZ works as far as uh, Azure. You would think that Azure would actually allow it to say, hey, you know what, it already exists, continue on, but you have to script that into your own shell scripts. So the next part of it, if it doesn't exist, it's gonna create the group using AZ group create. You specify the location and resource and it's gonna create your group. Now that you have the group created, you can go through and create your Azure Container Service. That's where things get a little bit fun. So we actually did a check to show whether or not the Azure Container Service already exists. Um, if it does, then it's gonna confirm that it already exists, I can't continue. If it does not, then it's gonna create the Azure Resource Group based on the resource group name of the previous step. 
service name that you define, the DNS prefix, the orchestrator. Again, this is a script that I wrote to where you can be able to switch that in with Kubernetes or DCOS or Swarm. Um, otherwise, the orchestrator type could just say Swarm in plain text. And then the SSH key, and that's the path for the SSH key that you plan to use. And then the next part of it is it's just gonna call that function so you get the outputs from that step and it's done. It's a very, very simple step because all you're using is essentially two commands. You're creating your resource group and you're creating your deployment. But you're putting it into that infrastructure as code so you can go back and change this for any kind of environment. If we go back and look at the services file where we're defining it, everything that I'm specifying in this particular script where I'm saying create this group with these variables that's what I've defined right here in the variables in the services file. So they all connect uh, interchangeably. The second part of it is where we got a little bit, it, it got a little bit trickier, which was the SSH tunnel. So the first part of it is we have our Docker file where I showed you that step creating. So the Docker file itself is I'm copying the uh, private key to the containers uh, uh, local folder for SSH. I'm changing the permissions on that because by default through the copy, it's for some reason wants to set it to 644. So I change the permissions back to 400, and then I'm turning SSH on, and I'm adding that particular key to the list of identities. The next part is I have to, again, set the Docker host to be colon 2375, and I'm having that confirm back to me that that was successfully set. I'm exposing the port for the container so I can connect to it, and then I'm copying the script locally from the repo to the container so that it's gonna be self-contained in that image, and then running again, uh, making that script executable because it is just a shell script, the entry point, it's going to automatically execute that script, and then command is, is shell. It's a very simple 27 line Docker file. The next part of it is that uh, SSH tunnel deployment script. This is going to check to see, this is a script you could use outside of just obviously CD, um, for, if for some reason you wanted to, but it's gonna actually see if you're already logged into Azure. If you're not, it's going to log you in, again using the same service principle method we've discussed. It's gonna capture again your FQDN, your agent's FQDN, and your admin username. And here on line 28 is where stuff is actually starting to happen. There are until loops because when you're trying to do this in a continuous deployment scenario, um, by the time Azure actually stands up the infrastructure, it still has to turn on all the services. And so one of the errors that I found is I couldn't actually create the SSH session and I couldn't run any Docker commands against it because while the service was created, the actual pieces to ACS hadn't actually started yet. So as a result, I actually set um, until loops in here. So let me use this. So we have, this is the SSH command. If you notice, that's the same exact command I had written on the slide. Um, that's the same command that's taken from Microsoft's documentation. Um, and so again, all it's doing is creating an SSH tunnel uh, through the SSH uh, session, which ACS uses uh, 2200, that's already open. It's specifying a key. It's turning off strict key host checking. Um, it's keeping the server alive, so that'll keep that tunnel open. And then it's gonna, uh, I'll put that to null so that I can just make my own message that the tunnel was successfully open. It's gonna retry that up to five times. If it's not ready, it's gonna retry within five seconds just so that service can become available. Then the next step is where we're gonna check to make sure that the ACS cluster is actually ready to fire off commands. You might have built the image, but from a continuous deployment session, it still has to turn on and Docker still has to do certain things on the actual agents part of it. So for that, again, we have another until loop, but this is going to retry every 45 seconds, um, and it's just doing a simple check to uh, see if there are any nodes available. Otherwise, I would say there aren't any. Down here, and some of this was actually taken from Docker itself, where if you wanna pass commands directly to Docker, you actually have to capture that into uh, an argument. So that's what this part is doing right down here, and then after, uh, it sets the Docker command that allows me to say whatever is right here and it's gonna capture it in dollar sign at. Uh, then the end part of it is just, a, again, a reminder where your web applications can be used and it's going to ex execute the supplied command, which again, it captured that particular command, Docker run nginx into a variable. And it's gonna retry that command in case, again, Docker Swarm wasn't ready to deploy that image. It's gonna retry that up to five times every five seconds. Um, and so that adds in, again, like, retry logic to make sure that it succeeds, again, from that automatic dominoes firing off. In case it wasn't ready, it's not just gonna say, oh, I broke. No, okay, go ahead and retry it. It might not have been ready for that second. Now it should be ready in the next second. Um, so that's that SSH tunnel. And those are the two main pieces of how that's working aside from the services and the steps file itself. 
So the end result would be you getting to actually go to, say, this particular uh, DNS name, and you'd see your newly published image from that you pushed to GitHub, that code ship fired off, created in Azure, you'd be able to view that Nginx website in a browser. And I would love to show you that if code ship service wasn't necessarily degraded. Let's see. Let's see their status right now. Still partially degraded service. Mm -hmm. GitHub degraded performance. So just to give code ship a uh, shout out, uh, GitHub paused webhooks. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's on GitHub. <laughs> What's funny is I seriously, I tried this at 9 a.m. before I left to come here, and I was like, awesome, everything's working. <laughs> Earlier in the week when I was testing it, Azure actually had an issue where SPNs weren't working. So I was like, well, dang it, okay. So I tested again. I was like, please don't let it be an Azure issue, which, I, I mean, Azure's doing a lot of new things. We're, we're releasing new features every single day. So sometimes we'll even text each other back and forth, be like, well, this service is down. So that was my biggest fear. I didn't expect it to be <laughs> GitHub or uh, CodeShip. But everything did work at 9, so I'm guessing in another few hours. Uh, again, this code is available on CodeShip's uh, repo. It's available on mine. I blogged extensively about how each script works, aside from just talking very fast in a public demo. Um, so that way, if you guys wanted to go either uh, fork it and play with it yourself, you can set up CodeShip for free. So you can set it up to try it out. You can set up an Azure account uh, for free, get started. You get, I think, 150 credits or something like that for 30 days. Um, so you can kind of play around with it. But overall, let's see. If I go back to the presentation. So let me start from this slide. So again, we've talked about pretty much why all this matters is because of DevOps. That's the mindset that we're really starting to see play into our dev and IT or ops kind of world. I, I keep wanting to call it IT and apparently the new word is ops. It's just, I think of ops and I think of spectacles, but we are seeing this shift. So the old world previously, and I mean, that was the world that I kind of worked in previously was, I mean, it was IT. Everything was you focus on planning just enough to get it working. There's nothing really proactive about it. So you're competing against each other. You're not collaborating with each other. You have static hierarchies. There's individual productivity. I pretty much worked by myself and kept telling developers that what they gave me didn't work. Um, and then they told me I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, it was, it was completely inefficient. Um, so that's where we get into there was no efficiency of process. And there's assumptions. I'm making assumptions. Developers are making assumptions. There's no actual productivity. There's no end result. But in the new world with DevOps, you now are focused on delivering. So both, I mean, when you think about it from a conceptual basis, IT and Dev has, have the same goals. One, not to get phone calls at 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. Two, to make their managers happy. And three, to ultimately deliver what we're paid to deliver. So now we can focus on that. We can focus on delivering. We can collaborate to win, which I think is a little cheesy. But we're ultimately collaborating so that we can actually not want to pull our hair out and throw mugs at each other at the end of the day. Um, we have fluent and flexible teams. We're able to have collective value creation. And then we have effectiveness of outcomes. We can experiment, learn, and respond. So again, that goes back into the metrics. We can take a look at the logs. We can learn from what we've done and how we can better improve that in future deployments. So then oh, the recap, again, we talked about how do we connect the authentication method. So since all this code is available on GitHub, and again, like I said, the demo was supposed to be with CodeShip. But you, I mean, you saw the code. It's all shell scripts. It's all shell scripts automating essentially Azure deployments. So that's, co that's scripts that you can run locally. You don't have to use Jet. You don't have to use CodeShip. You have your infrastructure as code that you can manipulate. And you can tie that in with Jenkins or VSTS or whatever tool you want to use. So you start the biggest piece of that that we had to be able to, to give you to support that was the non-interactive method, which that is how the SPS, SPN creation script works. Um, and that was the biggest piece. So now that you have that piece, you can take that and use it in whatever environment you want. Uh, I do have, uh, not in this particular repo, but on one of the repos that is in a blog post, I do have, again, script that does actually just export those environment variables to bypass the code ship part of it, because I thought that would be of value to end users in case, I'm not saying you have to use this tool, this is just the tool that brought this particular, uh, I guess, discovery about. Um, and so that was the biggest part, was the non-interactive authentication method. Again, the code is scalable. It's just infrastructure as code. And so also for those of you who may not be in the uh, enterprise environment right now or aren't already working in the field, but you want to kind of get there, 
this is code that you can also look at and learn from and manipulate. And I'm not saying that it's necessarily perfect, but one of the ways that I know I learned was looking at other people's code. I think that's the way that we all learn and get better. And so you can look at this and see how you can adapt it, use it, manipulate it. If you have a suggestion on how I can improve it, I mean, submit a PR. Like, the, the best part about Microsoft really playing around with other companies and with other tools is we're partnering. We want to de de deliver tools that's going to work best for you. And so in the past year alone, Microsoft has open sourced PowerShell Core, .NET Core, and Visual Studio Code. In October of last year, GitHub actually did an independent study. Does anybody know who the number one contributor to open source projects was? Yeah. We beat Facebook by at least 700, which, I mean, isn't necessarily a stellar number, but that was impressive to us. And the biggest part of us being the number one contributor was because of our uh, open source project for Visual Studio Code specifically, and the amount of pull requests we've accepted from members of the community. I mean, the cool one of the reasons I love using that tool is not because it works well, not because it ties into GitHub, and not because it's just an easy tool to use on my Mac, but because it's also something that was written by more than just Microsoft. That's one tool that's an example of it's written by the community. It's showing the future of where we're kind of going. And so again, that's my long spiel on uh, open source and, and this. The le last part, I guess, would just be questions. We finished a little early because of uh, the demo. Do you have a, a, a tear down trip on the other side of the, so you oh, to take stuff, you run your job, it passes, you get the report back. Do you have a tear down? I don't have a teardown script. Um, I can tell you immediately the command is just going to be az delete resource group. So you can you just wipe the entire thing out? With all you can wipe it out. I mean, if you wanted to get even further, I, I, I could definitely write that in where you, you want to keep the resource group, but you want to delete the service. I mean, that would be, again, you could tie in like retry logic or loops, but you're essentially going to do either you're deleting the resource group or you're deleting the container service. The other part of it I can show you, because the first step of what we actually wrote was the infrastructure itself. And so let me pull up. Are resource groups sort of just a, a, a flag that you can apply to any resource within Azure to logically group them together? So that's a good question. Um, that's actually, let me actually go into Azure since, I, I mean, how many people to what also joined this particular session to learn about continuous deployment DevOps? How many people were really interested in Azure? I work on Azure. You work on Azure, okay. I'm one of the Okay, perfect. So I could, so essentially there's a large container where you put all your stuff in. So you would have your VM, you would have your uh, VNets, you would have all your other components, all of the environment mm -hmm. in there. And so when she says AZ uh, remove the container, everything goes away. So that's what we do. I mean, we put all of our test machines into containers so we can just go pip and it disappears. You so say container as in, not as in a Linux not container, just as yeah, I, I, I call it a file cabinet. A file cabinet or yeah, yeah. It, not, not a Docker. Yeah. Right, right, right. So, so, so this is an example. So these are resource groups that I have. This is my Microsoft subscription. Um, in beneath that, this is one that I started deploying this morning when, again, it did work from CodeShip. Just <laughs> if GitHub webhooks didn't have an issue. But you'll notice, so within this particular resource group, I have access controls to this resource group, resource cost deployments. This is those metrics in the insight. And then beneath that is where you can see all the different resources. And you can even uh, look at it by type. So you can see storage accounts that have to be created, container service itself, uh, the virtual machine scale set, public IP address, the load balancers I mentioned, virtual network. There's a lot of pieces that go into that. Um, and so again, the resource group is literally just a group. This is um, the newer uh, method of how Azure works. The previous portal, the classic portal that I don't think anyone ever uses anymore, didn't allow this. So now you'll also hear ARM. Uh, Microsoft will actually mention ARM all the time. That's Azure Resource Manager. It is, it, it's not hardware. So there's the keywords container, ARM. Sometimes Microsoft takes that and repurposes the, the uh, acronyms for our own benefit. But with that, again, it's just it, the Azure Resource Manager allows you to uh, deploy this out in this kind of structure. You can also deploy things out using uh, JSON templates. That's another benefit of ARM or Azure Resource Manager. And the JSON templates allows you to essentially take things as objects and move them around. Um, so it's just a scalable version to be able to keep your stuff in code and use for, again, the enterprise. Um, if that explains it a little bit more, we can see then, like, here's another one. This is actually, I'm going to do another talk tomorrow on open source and, and Linux. 
and we're gonna actually show your tube, which is a web app that some colleagues of mine wrote during a hackathon that actually pulls, it's just a simple web service, but it actually pulls the uh, content from YouTube and gives you a download link where you can just save that content. I'm not saying there's any kind of legality to it, it was just a fun little project we did. Um, and so this is one where I actually um, <laughs> pu pushed it to a web app service uh, and you can see there's only three resources in it because this is one that's actually platform as a service. Um, it's just a web app uh, and it, you can see the insights into that, but this particular one was deployed outside of a CICD tool, but was just deployed by a webhook into GitHub itself. So you can again, do, you do have Azure integration to GitHub directly if you didn't want to use a different tool. Um, I can, since again, I do have a little bit of time, I'll just, uh, whoops, that's not YouTube, let's go to your tube. So this is the simple extractor bot. It, you can chat with it and say, uh, I don't know, give me, I think the demo we did was, it was one of the Mr. Wiggles or something on Disney or something like that. But this is all, again, tying into Azure. And this was one that was pushed from a GitHub repo. Um, and again, for this particular one, there's the resources, there's only three because it's platform as a service, first infrastructure. Uh, and so CodeShip, the other part of it, their original repo right here, this particular deployment script is actually standing up uh, individual resources. So it's logging in, it looks a little different. This particular one, I'm using a template where my, uh, Azure has uh, quick start templates which are available on GitHub. And so this is just a simple Linux, uh, simple Ubuntu VM. It's using a JSON template. It's naming the deployment. And this is actually again going to, this is uh, the old version. This is using uh, the node version of Azure because AZ AZ CLI 2.0 wasn't out yet. Um, but this is creating the resource group and then it's creating a deployment. So using the Docker simple Ubuntu VM, we we're actually just creating a simple Docker VM in Azure. And for that, it has to stand up all the individual infrastructure as a service resources. It's not the container service. But you can substitute this particular template out with any template you wanted to use. Again, going back to infrastructure as code. Quick question, and I apologize if it's uh, sort of uh, Azure 101 sort of question. That's fine. So the tenant ID is referencing the ID for your actual account. Okay. So, so it, app ID. Uh, not an app ID because your app ID is kind of the app registration you're creating. Your tenant ID is going to stay with when you um, have an Azure account, you're going to have your, your email address. So I have two different Azure accounts. I have one on my Microsoft one and I have one that's on my live address that was tied to me being an MVP. Um, both of those are going to have different tenant IDs, but any subscription within that, it's still going to be the same tenant ID. It's just your Azure account. So with, with uh, different branches, say you have your development branch, QA branch, when you run it through uh, the Azure command line, say go out and deploy this branch using whatever CI, does that use Azure deployment slots or does it stand up a whole new uh, container group to test it out? <laughs> uh, it would stand up a whole new container group unless you specify push out to this slot. Okay. So I mean the, the beauty of using Azure CLI and doing this in code is you're just using the command line tool that we've already given you. You're just putting it into a shell script. Sure. And so if you use AZCLI as part of a shell script, you just look up the switch for deployment slot and say, okay, push this to this slot and you reference that slot in your code. Great. Um, that's, I mean, that's the beauty, even um, the, not this particular code, but the one that I did here, let me cancel out of that. So here where I'm specifying the SSH key, I can specify whichever key I want to use. I can also change this switch entirely and say generate dash SSH. So it's going to generate new keys for me. So you can change any one of these switches to be anything or you can specify uh, whatever switch it would be for the deployment slot. I don't know that one off the top of my head. Sure. But it, you just right. update that command, save the script, and then it would fire off. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, any other questions? They don't have to be about CD. It could be about Azure. Pretty random, but okay. uh, what shell are you using? Uh, I'm using ZSH with oh my ZSH, power level 9K, uh, Tmux. I actually have an entire blog post where you can see my entire layout. Right, cool. And I have, um, so on my shell for ZSH, the bottom line here, this is actually just a bash script that's running that's pulling my uh, private and public IP address because I switch around to different environments, so I care about that. Um, and then it confirms this is my, my first screen. If I'm playing Spotify, it'll actually update and pull my Spotify that I'm playing, battery health life, date, this particular one at the end was pretty fun. Um, if I'm SSH'd in, it'll change the host name. All of that's also on GitHub. 
Uh, any other questions? They can also be related to this. All right. Well, I guess uh, since the webhooks were down, you have guys, you have an extra 20 minutes back.